So, in the Middle East there are no rules, but in boxing there is jab, cross, hook, uppercut. So, in this show, I will teach you about the truth. No more fake news. No more fake history. Only the truth. Are you here to join me for the truth? Are you here to join me and subscribe to the show and like my show in order to know the truth and to fight back? Are you ready to fight back? Are you ready to join me? Are you with me? This is Shul Romano Horin, the host of Shul Romano Horin Show. So what is the story of my family? What is my story that made me, you, to listen to me and learn about the Middle East and learn about the truth about the Middle East and Israel? My father was born in uh, Damascus, Syria, uh, under the French mandate, and grew up in Beirut, Lebanon, which was also under the French mandate. His family were really expelled in 1492 uh, by the Spanish Inquisition from Spain when they wanted to purify the Spanish race. They kicked the Jews out. And the mother of my father decided, family, to go straight to the Ottoman Empire that really wanted to welcome them, which was a Muslim rule, and to arrive to Syria and Lebanon, where they dealt with trade there and were in, really in the Jewish ghetto in the area. But my father's father, family, decided instead of going straight to the area uh, of the Ottoman, that they will really find refuge in the Italian uh, area of Venice and uh, Levon. And uh, there, in the beginning, they welcomed them, the Italian, and then they built the first ghetto in 1516. And then the Jews had to be confined to that ghetto, but still they were dealing with dread, especially with the Levnat, which is Syria and Lebanon, and then we fed trade from China and connected to Europe. So this is, and also they dealt with printing. They start to have a printing houses and printed many thousands and thousands of Jewish books at the time. Uh, but then they waited for the opportunity, and uh, when uh, they abolished the ghetto, they were there till the uh, beginning of 1800, and Napoleon took over and gave emancipation and rights to Jews, they felt free enough to get out of the ghetto, to get out of it, Italy, and they went to dance in Prussia. They became a Prussian a really citizen with passport, and again they dealt, they were in a port and dealt with trade, with Livnat, with uh, Jews in Syria, and Lebanon, and China, and the Indies, and India. That's what they dealt with, and printing. But then in 1873, the uh, stock market in Pusa and many places collapsed, and there was a deep depression, and again they had to blame the Jews. So my family packed their things again, and they went to the Ottoman Empire at the time, around the 1870, to uh, Syria and Lebanon, where they had trade with, and also had a lot of uh, family and uh, Jews that escaped from uh, Spanish Inquisition before. They were there. Uh, my father was born in Damascus, Syria, and then he grew up uh, in Lebanon. And, uh, and then they moved really mainly to Lebanon. They lived there in the Jewish ghetto. Uh, uh, and in 1917, it was uh, the British and the French were able to uh, defeat uh, the Ottoman Empire. And there was a mandate, over, uh, a French mandate. In uh, World War II, in the beginning, in 1939, there was a World War II started. Uh, Jews were slaughtered. In, in, by Nazi Germany, all over Europe, it started. And this is the time in which my grandfather, Shlomo, the father of my father, decided since he had a printing house in uh, Lebanon to print leaflet against the Vichy government, the pro-Nazi Vichy government, that uh, really wanted to bring, uh, to give access to the Nazis uh, in the area to fight against the Allies, and of course, kill Jews. He was uh, caught, he was imprisoned when he was distributing leaflets in all the streets in Beirut. And then he was uh, imprisoned and he was tortured. 
1941 July, the British were able and the Allies to defeat the Vichy government, and then my grandfather was released and decided to go to the land of Israel under the British mandate. And, um, and my father, so this was 1941, and my father, that was then 15, in 1942, decided to cross the border between uh, Lebanon and uh, British mandate Palestine, which was the land of Israel, because Palestine all the time was a name for, for the Jewish state. Uh, my mother and my father that were in Israel, they were called Palestinian. They had a Palestinian ID, which was really, say, Palestinian and the ID, Palestine, the land of Israel, Eretz Israel. So the Jews were called Palestinian. The Arabs were called Arab. The Greek were called Greek. So he was there, he was caught by the British, and uh, they wanted to kick him out, but he was able to, my uncle, to convince them to let him be a member of the British police and protect the Jewish community. And that's what he did. In 1944, the British decided to establish the Jewish Brigade of the British Army and to recruit 5,000, the top uh, Jewish fighter, to go and give them a chance to fight against Nazi Germany that was slaughtering Jews in concentration camps and gassing them, almost six million Jews by then, one and a half million Jewish children. So my father uh, arrived there in 1944, and they really fought one of the last fights in Belgium and Holland. And when the war was over, they were helping Jewish refugees. They were, my father used to say, all skeletons. They were only bones. They were looking at him, staring at him, like as if him they didn't see. There were piles of bodies of children and women. Piles of bodies were murders. There were ashes all over. It was a nightmare, no home to go to. So he went to, he brought a lot of the refugee to Italy, where there a lot of refugees, some of the Jews were established in Italy, and they were waiting for somebody to take them. At the time, the British, even though they won the war, even though during the World War II they decided that uh, they didn't let the Jews come in because they didn't want to, you know, to divert uh, resources, they want everybody to be united. Even after the war, they decided to stop Jewish immigration of those refugees that were waiting to go some home, not to allow to come in. So my father in 1946, when they disbanded the Jewish Brigade, he went back to Palestine to, under the British mandate. He was an explosive expert under the British and that everything he learned from the British, he used against them. He joined the underground of the Menachem Begin of the Irgun and, in, uh, and they fought against the British, trying to help smuggle Jews from in. And a lot of people in the Irgun were also Jewish refugees from the Holocaust. And then, in 1947, the 29th of November, the United Nations decided to have a partition plan to divide the area west of the Jordan River to two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state. And Jerusalem would have been an international city administered by the United Nations. The Jews accepted it, but not the Arabs. And they started a civil war against us explosive shooting the local Arabs. There was no such concept as Palestinian because there were Arabs all around. They were called all Arabs. There was no differentiation. So there were, uh, there was shooting. And uh, in one of those uh, time when the British were, so the Arabs were going after my father, who was a member of the Irgun, of Menachem Begin, his leader, and the British went after him. And one day when he was uh, in Tel Aviv on the beach, he saw a British soldier coming toward him. He was afraid they would catch him because they were trying to catch the Irgun members. They were fighting against them. And he caught my mother, he gave her a kiss, and he told her, please be quiet, they're after me. I'm a member of the Irgun. She continued kissing him, and then they got married three months after, March 9, 1948. And while they were getting married on the border between Jaffa and Tel Aviv, there were shootings in the air. And then on uh, May 14, the British left the land of Israel. And then that same day, Ben Gurion declared the independence of Israel. President Truman 
was the first American that recognized the new Jewish state, the new Jewish government, and they declared independence, Ben Gurion, according to the partition plan of a Jewish home. But not the Arabs, they refused. Five Arab nations invaded the little Jewish state. They told the local Arabs to get out in order to give them space to slaughter the Jews that throw them to the sea. But these 600,000 Jews that fought against millions of Arabs around them, they're trying to destroy the Jewish state. They fought hard. There was no other alternative. And then 20,000 soldiers fought against hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And they had so much weapon. My uncle, which is the youngest brother of my father, Yaakov Romano, he was 15 at the time, and he was only a civilian then. And then uh, aircraft, the Egyptian aircraft came to Tel Aviv, and while he was running home with the siren, the bomb, the Shlush uh, bridge, and he was killed at the spot. My father and his brother was also in there, continue fighting, and part of their goon, they were able to defeat them and take over Jaffa. We were fighting very hard. We were able to defeat the enemies, but we also had a lot of losses, 6,000, 1 percent were Israelis died in that war. But we were able to expand this little partition area that we given through the partition, and we took over also Western Jerusalem, but the Jordanian were able to take Eastern Jerusalem, the old city, the Western Wall, the Temple Mount, and all the holy sites of the Jews, and the West Bank, Judah and Samaria. And for 19 years, they took over and they controlled it. And according to the armistic plan, they were supposed to let the Jews pray. But no, they kicked the Jews out of the French, of the quarter, of the Jewish quarter. They kicked them out. All the Jews, they expelled them and then they destroyed. 36 synagogues, they damaged others, they burned books. They destroyed the Mount of Olives. They took stones of, uh, you know, the people were buried. It says it's the oldest graveyard of the Jewish people's cemetery. They destroyed them. They removed that body in order to create roads and hotel on the, that cemetery, the Mount, on Mount of Olives. And then there was a war zone. The East Jerusalem was divided. My grandfather in 1950, he went and he, but we defeated them and he was able, he bought a house on Mamila Street. Mamila Street is just outside the Jaffa Gate, the old city of Jerusalem, where all the holy sites are there. And the, the road is like three quarter was Jewish outside of the wall in the western side of Jerusalem. And the third was no man's zone. It was the border, there was wires and there were barriers, and there were grenades, and there were mines. It was, and there were sniper, Jordanian sniper for 19 years on the wall of Jerusalem, shooting at Jews in Western Jerusalem. I want only to mention that as a little girl, I used to go, I was born in, I was born in 1959, and when I was four and five and six, I went there. When the Jordanians were trying to shoot at me, a little girl in Western Jerusalem, My mother, from my mother's side, she's a Yemeni Jew that were there, arrived from 300 before the common era to 300 and after the common era, also looking for a spell after the destruction of the temple, they're from the first temple and the second temple, and for trade opportunity, and they were there living in a second, uh, uh, second uh, great citizens, and, but they were very religious in trade. They were, in the, they were doing a lot of ritual slaughtering and were religious and rabbi in Yemen. And they live in Tyre's Yemen. And uh, in 1906, they decided to leave because the imam, there was civil unrest, the imam were fighting the Ottoman. And all the time when there is a fighting and there is starvation, they have to blame the Jews. So before that, they decided to get up, pack their things, after they were there for thousands of years in Yemen, they packed their tin, they went through the Djibouti, the Red Sea, 
They took a train and they arrived in 1906 to the Red Arrow, Ethiopia. My mother was born in the Red Arrow, Ethiopia. They were there for 30 years. They, and my mother was born there. They had a very good life. They were very well off. They were a silversmith and a goldensmith. And they were doing very well. And they were teachers and Hebrew teachers, knew several languages. My mother was in Alain studying in French nunnery. But then they heard in October 1935 that Mussolini, that uh, was known as quite a vicious dictator and were uh, really looking for Jews in uh, Libya, that he is coming to Ethiopia, to conquer Ethiopia. So they decided to pack their thing, sell everything, gather everything they got, and to leave Ethiopia. So in October 1935, they left, they went back, the way they came in to, and they went to Thais and from Thais to Aden that was controlled by the British. They took a vessel and in 1936 they went through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal and they arrived in Jaffa. In 1936 my mother arrived there. There was a horrible economic situation. The British controlled there. There were a lot of riots and slaughter by the Arabs, but they were in a home. They were in a safe haven, a Jewish home, trying to build a Jewish home with a Hebrew language. And my mother was very excited about it, even though the economic and the slaughter were continue. But we were fighting for our land, till, of course, she met my father. So I was born in 1959. And this is when Jerusalem is divided, when the Arabs, the Jordanian, control the so-called disputed territory, the so-called occupied territory of the West Bank and East Jerusalem and all the holy side of the Jews, of the Christians, of the Muslim. And they never let the Jews pray. And they were shooting at Jews like me, as I mentioned, in Western Jerusalem. And I remember as a kid, my grandfather used to say to me, you have to be careful when you get out. You have to go quickly run to the right, run, 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 till you arrive to the Jewish neighborhood. And that's what I did over the years. I thought it was normal to be in such an area. And, uh, but I all time thought, it's so interesting. How come I cannot go and visit the Western Wall or the Temple Mount or the Jewish site or the Camp of the Patriarch? And then in 1967, despite the fact that the Arabs, and all this area, they had Sinai and they had Gaza by Egypt and then they had the Golan Heights by the Syrian and then they, Jordan had uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem and all the holy site and which they destroy and had sewer water all over the, the Western Wall. Still, they were ready to attack the Jewish state to destroy the little tiny Jewish state, 9 to 15 miles wide. I remember I was second grade, I was seven years old. And, uh, and suddenly, uh, when Israel realized that they are mobilizing the forces, they had a preemptive attack against them. And it took us six days, but we were able to defeat them. And I remember the siren, I still remember, I was seven years old. And I was at school, and suddenly I heard the siren. And at that time, they were controlling the hill, the, the, the hills of Judah and Sabaya, looking down of all the seashore of 80% of the Jewish people that are population on the seashore. And uh, it was so narrow. And they told us that we have to run home. And I remember I ran and ran home, and I arrived home, and we had to cover the windows and, and to eat only kind of food, and then go down under the building to the bomb shelter and stay there for six days. But it was such a glory. We were able to defeat all of them, even though we defeated the Syrian army. And we were able to take over the Golan Heights as a result of their attack. We went after the John Daniel, we begged them not to join. And they decided to join the fight. And we kicked them out. We were able to defeat them and kick them out of East Jerusalem to take over and unite the city at last. And to reunite and to get for the first time to pray as the Jewish people in a free land in the Western Wall. And then we took over the West Bank, Judah and Samaria. 
And we made them free and united and free for all to pray and to worship at last. So I remember uh, three weeks after they cleared the Western Wall and my father said, we are going. So we all took a car and we all drove for the first time to see the Western Wall. They cleared by then the, all the houses and the sewers and the filth around the Western Wall, the total disregard to the area. And it was the first time we were really touching and kissing. And then we went to the Temple Mount, where it's the holiest site of the Jews. And I, we went and saw the Temple Mount. And, uh, and then we went to the Cave of the Patak in Hebron. And we went to the Tomb of Rachel in, uh, in Bethlehem, the outskirts of Bethlehem. And they were quite nervous. They didn't know what the Jews would do. But then Diane immediately gave them authority to the WAF, the Muslim uh, uh, committee, administ religious committee, to, to have an administrative authority over the Temple Mount, our Temple Mount. And then he gave them administrative authority in the cave of the Patrick, sharing with them a place that they didn't let us even pray one second. But we were free at last to pray in the places and to travel. It was 1967. It was the glory win. And this is the time in which the United States started to become our friend because we were proving that we can fight back, we can win. And this is when the alliance with Israel start, and United States and Israel start, the friendship begin. Because for 19 years, after, after Truman, recognition of Israel, nothing happened. And then we, uh, the war of attrition began, and then uh, the PLO that was established in 1964, the Palestinian terrorist organization, was established while the Jordanian controlled the area, and the purpose of the establishment was to destroy the Jewish state. They started with the terror attack against us, first from Jordan, then from, from, uh, from Lebanon. And then we had them starting to attack us in hotel and killing hundreds, killing in an airport, the PLO terrorists. And then we had the Munich attack in 1972, in which 11 Israeli athletes were murdered in, the, in Germany, in Munich, the Olympics, because they were Jews and they were tortured before. And then the 1973 war started. I remember I just started uh, high school. I was so excited. And we, you know, there were uh, rumors that there is all kind of exercises by the Egyptian and the Syrian, but you know, the government all time comes down and say everything is wonderful, we are strong, we are powerful, they are not as strong as us, underestimating really the other side. And then I remember there was the Yom Kippur War. And uh, I remember that uh, day, because usually in Yom Kippur, the roads and the highway are all closed. It means only children and uh, with bicycle and skateboard are running around. No cars are driving in Yom Kippur, in any of the streets in Israel, in any of the driving, in every, any of the highway. It's all silence. It's only people walking in the middle of the street, middle of the highway. No car. It's only I'm going to the synagogue and I see jeeps in the morning, jeeps, military jeep going and getting soldiers with their prayer shawl over their shoulder, coming in straight from the synagogue, straight to buses and cars, taking them to the war. The war started. They attack us. Egypt and Syria attack us in the holiest day of the Jew. The sad thing is that Golda Meir was the first prime minister, the only prime minister that was female in Israel. And she simply listened to the intelligence report and the military intelligence. And again, the defense minister was Moshe Dayan. It was telling him there is a low probability there will be a war. Even though so, there was so many information, there was mobilization of the Egyptian army and the Syrian army. In the border, there were tanks mobilization and they still underestimated them. There was uh, information and message were caught from the KGB, they were telling to the people on Thursday, two days before the war, that to get out of Egypt. Because, you know, 
There was so many intelligence. There was uh, the son-in-law of uh, Nasser, they used to be the president of uh, Egypt. It was an uh, Israeli spy. He warned us there would be a war and still in the ear, but because we wanted an accurate information and we couldn't understand the intelligence. How can it be that Egypt will attack the Jewish state without having any mix 23 coming or with Tad missile? They already were accumulating weapons while we, Israel, didn't get anything. We just started the relationship with the American. This was the Yom Kippur was under the President Nixon which was very pro-Israel, and Kissinger was the Secretary of State, and Schlesinger was the Secretary of Defense. And then what happened is that uh, during this time, uh, despite of all this information, then early in the morning of the Yom Kippur itself, it was, I remember it, because Yom Kippur started on the eve of Friday, and then Saturday, it was the Holy of the Holies, it's Yom Kippur, and it was Shabbat. And I remember that, uh, uh, so early in the morning, like 3.50 in the morning, they were called Golda Meir to say that the spy, the Egyptian spy said that there will be a war. They will start a war in Yom Kippur in the evening. So they offer uh, Prime Minister Golda Meir to have a preemptive attack to destroy the Egyptian army or the, uh, the Air Force and the Syrian. And uh, Golda Meir was afraid what the world would say. If she was intimidated by Kissinger, she said, don't ever try to start a war again. So she decided you know, that, that the world will not be upset, the United States will not be upset, we will not have a preemptive attack. It was a horrible war. 2,700 Israelis died, which is a huge number for Israel that only has now 6.9 million Jews. At the time, we had, what, 4 million Jews? It was a lot of people died in that war, Israeli soldiers. They were fighting. We didn't have enough weapon, and we didn't expect the attackers for the first three days. One-tenth of the Air Force was destroyed. The tanks, hundreds of tanks were destroyed. Hundreds of Israeli soldiers were, uh, were uh, prisoners of war, and they died on both sides, also in Syria, in the Golan Heights. The Egyptian crossed the Suez Canal and they arrived uh, almost to the middle. And they stopped, they hesitated which ten God because of the deterrence of Israel. And then when the Golan Heights, the first three days they were going, they were going so smoothly, there was almost nobody there to stop them. They almost, they were on the outskirts of the Galil, but they also stopped. And they stopped and let Israel recruit the reserve, because 75% of the, uh, the fighting uh, army of Israel is, consists of reserve. So it took us three days, and then we fought back. We were able to have a counterattack against the Syrian and defeat them all the way, and then start to shell in Damascus within a week. We went pre after the ceasefire of 1967, and then we had to do what to do about Egypt. They were in the middle of Sinai, they were ready, they were continue proceeding. And this is when Israeli decided with the head, the leader, the amazing hero of Israel, Ariel Sharon, he led them in a fight. They crossed the Suez Canal and they circled and then returned back and circled the third army of the Egyptian. They starved them and isolated them. And then they proceed the other group toward Cairo, and they were not far away from there. And this is when they start begging for a ceasefire. So it's so strange, they all started on the 6th of October, and it was over the ceasefire 24 of October. It was really only 18 days, but for me it seems like weeks. I remember I didn't have school and I had to sit on my stairs, and all around me there were only old people and women and children. And I didn't see it. No, everybody was fighting. And every day we discover another neighbor die, another soldier die. My gym teacher I just met for one month, he died. He was a handsome guy with blue eyes and blonde. And he died. So many people died. So many were funeral. And we couldn't understand what happened. Because in the Sixth Day War, we, we defeated all of them in six days. Now we were not. And, and 
Golda Meir begged Nixon and President Nixon at the time that was they just started to be involved with Watergate and Kissinger that we need weapons. We need to replenish the weapon because the Russian, the Soviet Union were bringing so much weapons to the Egyptian to fight us. And Kissinger hesitated and, and nothing happened. They only promised with nothing and we needed it and it was going lower and lower the stock. And then Golda Meir had to call Nixon and Nixon said to Kissinger, no, we have to do it now. We have to, otherwise our reputation will destroy us and all, all over the Middle East. And when they were trying to argue, oh, maybe we should have only three airplanes or four airplanes, they said, no, everything we got. So they send us not only jet and airplane and in the Ben Gurion airport, every 15 minutes they said there was another, another airplane with weapons, with artillery, with tanks, with uh, everything you think about helping us to survive. And the people in the Ben Gurion, they said the Tel Aviv people went there to welcome the American soldier that came, you know, really to save us. And they said that uh, there were tears in the eyes of the Prime Minister Golda and uh, and we knew that you know it would be turned it was october 13 and then we defeat them this was a tough war a very tough war and we decided that from now on no matter what the world say there will be a preemptive attack because they are willing to attack us in the holiest day of the jews where we pray and atone and fast and then uh, after that there was more terror uh, the PLO attacked us in Malot in a school. They murdered 23 uh, children. They went to kindergarten. They went to buildings where people they live. And I remember I used to play in a place for me to hide in a closet. And then in one of the terrorist attacks, a mother also was hidden with, uh, during a terrorist attack by the PLO in a building in a closet in their apartment. And then she suffocated her own kid. And the other kid, his head was smashed by the butt of the rifle by the terrorists, Palestinian terrorists. So it was a very traumatic time for the Jewish people. In 1978, there was a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, Menachem Begin. 1977, he became a leader. But I was really upset about it, not only about that, it's because of the peace, it's because it's the first time we recognize that there are such people that are not simply Arabs, they're called Palestinians, and I was worried, and I was talking about it. And then, as I say, there was the wars in Lebanon, the PLO attacking us, there is again from the north, we are trying to protect ourselves, and then, uh, and then suddenly, 1993, I went to law school in 1990. I graduated in 1993. And I decided when I graduate, after I took the bar exam in August 1993, I arrived to Israel with my two children. I was so happy I finished law school. And suddenly I heard that the Israeli and the Rabin government were talking to Arafat, talking to Arafat, the man that hunted my nightmares as a child. It's a man that murdered and slaughtered children and women at school and kindergarten and coffee shop. This is a man that was not a man. He was a slaughterer, he was a terrorist, he was evil. And I couldn't understand how a hero like Prime Minister Rabin will do such thing. And while the Jewish people were so happy because there was the Oslo Agreement signed on September 13, 1993. So we are talking about 25 years anniversary just happened. 25 years. And I remember that my people were so happy. 75% were approving the Oslo Agreement. They were happy. They were talking about eating hummus in Damascus. They were so happy. They believed it and I was worried because I saw the terrorist attack. I saw the charade. I saw a divided country. I saw the infighting. I saw the death to come. I saw them coming everywhere and I saw them, you know, slaughtering us. And I was afraid that if God forbid we will have a Palestinian state controlling the high mountain looking down, it will be the end of us. But nobody wanted to listen. And I decided this is the beginning of my political activism. This is the one, the time in which I have to fight back. This is when I'm arriving to what I'm doing in this show. I had to start fighting back and tell my people things they didn't want to hear. 
that evil entered to our country and you cannot have peace with evil, you cannot have any agreement. And in the year 2000, for five years there was the Arafat campaign, they killed more than 1,000 Jews, children and women in disco and coffee shop and in synagogues and in school and everywhere there were bus explosions every day from those people that we let in with the PLO, with Arafat, the terrorists were coming in through the Oslo Agreement. And I was sad that my prediction came true. I was sad because so many people died and 5,000 were injured badly, teenagers and children and etc. And this is when I continue warning, continue telling, that's what I'm, I've done for the last 25. I'm warning about danger to Israel, about risk, about opportunity at the same time. So when people are saying to me, why I have this show? I have this show because there's an information war between fake news and fake history and the truth. So for the last six years, I've been teaching uh, boxing. And you see that I have the boxing glove. And um, so that's how I feel. I feel that we need to fight back. I feel that we need to fight fake news. I think that we need to fight fake history. So, in the Middle East there are no rules, but in Baghdad there is jab, cross, hook, uppercut. So in this show, I will teach you about the truth. No more fake news, no more fake history, only the truth. Are you here to join me for the truth? Are you here to join me and subscribe to the show and like my show in order to know the truth? and to fight back. Are you ready to fight back? Are you ready to join me? Are you with me? This is Shul Romano Horin, the host of Shul Romano Horin Show.